Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to speak a little bit about intervascular imaging-based algorithms to detect and manage coronary calcification. The goal of these next 15 minutes will be to give you a flavor of exactly what we look for on intravascular imaging to predict how calcium is going to behave, and as a result, how you may wish to treat it to ensure that you get the final results that you want, which is the biggest, best expanded stent that you can. This, was a, this is a, a, you know, a hat tip to the organizers of the meeting because this actually ends up being part one of a very nice two-part talk where the second part you'll get tomorrow where we talk about how or what devices to choose once you've detected and identified the severity of the calcium that you have. These are my disclosures. So let's look at this 79-year-old patient with re recurrent ISR. This is the, the image on the angiogram that all gives us a little bit of nausea. We hate seeing this, right? Where you've done this pre, you've done the pre-dilatation, you probably took a balloon that was too small for the artery, and then as a result, when you put in your stent, you have this dog bone. Then we start getting the trepidation of, oh boy, what do I do next? Do I take a bigger balloon? Do I take a smaller balloon at high pressures? And then you decide to image it, and you figure out that the reason you actually have this problem is because you have a thick circumferential layer of calcification that goes quite deep all the way behind the image. Um, let's see if I can pull out a pointer here, right, and point to you here where you have this deep, thick layer of calcium on the OCT, resulting in this dramatic area of underexpansion that you know is going to be a nidus for a problem. So is this common? Do we see this a lot? Sure we do, right? We either see it ourselves when we've made the mistake of doing this, or we see it when we're trying to clean up the mess that someone else has left behind. So when we look at whether or not this is a common problem, it takes us back to the DES studies that we've studied before, where moderate to severe calcification was actually an exclusion in a lot of these studies, and yet you see that approximately a third of patients, so one out of every three PCIs that you do, actually has moderate to severe calcification. And when you look at more modern studies like the Syntax trial that have actually looked at both left, that have looked at left main or triple vessel disease with both PCI and cabbage, these actually demonstrate heavy calcification in almost half of the patients. This is not a big surprise because it's patients who have bad coronary disease that were randomized to these trials. And this goes back to what Professor Malik said this morning, the patients that we should be treating are the ones with really bad coronary disease because those are the ones that we're going to make a difference, right? We're going to make a difference on their symptoms, a difference on their survival, a difference on their cardiovascular death. But that only makes sense if we actually treat them properly. So we recognize that when you have calcification, you're going to get bad outcomes. And as a result, you really need to make sure that you quantify it, define it, so that you can make sure you treat it appropriately. So does calcification matter? Does the amount of calcification in these studies matter? Well, let's look at this study, right? Let's look at this case here, where angiographically, you don't have a ton of calcification, right? This is the cine without any sort of contrast, and you don't see a ton of calcification. But then when you look at the IVUS, you have a fair amount of calcification across the IVUS that's actually 360 degrees in one place. But what's worth remembering is it's not just the arc of calcium that matters, right? It's the whole picture. So in this case, you have lots of, IVUS, uh, lots of calcium on the IVUS. But then when you look at the OCT, you see that most of the calcium is actually really thin, right? It's thin calcium. And the ver this makes us think about what variables on the calcium are actually important for us as interventionalists to decide how to treat a vessel, right? So if we go on to this study that looked at a small series of patients with and without angiographic calcium, right? So you saw calcium or you didn't see calcium on the angiogram. What they found was that in the vast majority of patients where there was no calcium visible on the angiogram, the thickness was less than half a millimeter, right? So relatively thin. And in these patients, you had good stent expansion. So when you have thin calcium, even when it goes all the way around, if you can't see it on the angiogram at all, you're probably okay. You're gonna get good stent expansion. But if you do see some calcium on the angiogram, you don't know where you are. You don't know if you're thick, you're thin, you're arced, you're not arced. And that's where you really have to get more information. So if we're starting to think about algorithms in our head, how to manage patients, if you see no calcium on an angiogram, you're probably pretty safe to just balloon and stent. 
let's say you see angiographically visible calcification. Well, this is then where um, uh, Akiko Mehara and colleagues took a, a group of patients to try to, to derive what the important features were using actually OCT of calcification in the coronaries. They, they divided patients into a test cohort and a validation court, cohort. And what they looked at was stent expansion based on the calcium features. What they found was that when you had a calcium angle of more than half the vessel, so more than 180 degrees, these were the patients that ended up having significant differences in their stent expansion. The same was predictive when you looked at calcium thickness over 0.5 millimeters, so more than half a millimeter, and calcium length over five millimeters. So you think to yourself then, okay, how do we create a score to predict stent expansion? Well, this is what they did next, right? And this is where they developed a calcium scoring system based on OCT, right? Where if your angle is greater than 180 degrees, you got two points. If your calcium thickness was greater than half a millimeter, you got one point. If your length was greater than five millimeters, you got one point. And then when you look at stent expansion, when you had more than two points, you had a problem and you needed to do something. But then when they looked at the actual predictors of calcium fracture, so what are we trying to achieve when we modify calcium? We're trying to get calcium fracture. We need the calcium to break in more than one place so that when you take an NC balloon next, you don't just fulcrum you actually create a space where the adventitia is, becomes your limiter again, not the case around the vessel, which is the calcification. When they looked at those features, what they found was that it's actually much higher arc of angulation of calcium, you know, 270 degrees with 0.5 millimeters of thickness that was more predictive than 180. So then they took all of the patients that were treated with IVIS-guided PCI, right, which is more common, because it you know, allows you to treat patients with chronic kidney disease. reverberation arc, it's less likely to be a problem, right? That's why the regression coefficients are positive here and negative here. Negative means you are less likely to get good expansion. Positive means it is less likely to be a problem, all right? So the bigger the vessel, the less likely you have a problem. The more reverberation, the less likely you are to have a problem because it means the calcium's thinner there, okay? And then when they developed this into a score using linear regression models, what they developed was greater than five millimeters of a calcium arc of over 270, right? So a 270 degrees of calcification, more than five millimeters long, that's worth a point. A vessel diameter per one millimeter, less than 3.5 is worth a point. Greater than 3.5, no points. Because remember, bigger vessel, less likely to have a problem. If there's a calcified nodule, you get a point. No calcified nodule, no point. And then if you have reverberation arc, 
over 90 degrees, right? So over one quarter, because that tells you then that the calcium in that entire 90 degree segment is thin enough to be expanded by a balloon. If it's more than 90 degrees, you get zero points. But if it's less than 90 degrees, so if you have just a tiny little bit of reverberation or no reverberation, you get a point. And then when you look at whether or not you can expand stents, what you find, very simple, is if you have more than 1.7 points, so functionally we can't split the points, right? If you have more than one of those features, if you have a nodule, if you have an arc of 270 degrees that spans more than five millimeters, if you have calcium plus a vessel less than 3.5, if you have the presence of a nodule, you are gonna have to calcium modify somehow. It's that simple. It's not a complicated scoring system for a reason because we need to be able to look at the image as we're doing our PCI, not waste any time and get to the point. So let's do this next one together. We see lots of calcium here, right? This is the baseline. So is the length of the calcium, uh, or sorry, is the arc of the calcium more than 270, millimeter, uh, 270 degrees? Yes, it is, right? It's almost 360 degrees. Do you have a calcified nodule here? No, you don't. So calcium over 270 degrees, but it's only 4.1 millimeters in length. So do you get a point? No, no point, right? Because it's not five millimeters. Do you have a calcific nodule? No nodule, so no point. Is the diameter large? Well, when you measure this from EEL to EEL in the spot where you can see, it's a 4.4 millimeter vessel, so no point. Is the reverberation arc greater than 90 degrees? Well, here is your reverberation arc, right? Let's look at how big it is. This is your 90 degrees. It goes beyond 90 degrees. So do you get a point? No, right? Because the calcium is thick in this whole, it's thin in this whole segment. That reverberation arc is greater than 90 degrees. That means this gets no points, which means when you balloon and you stent, you get a very nice result. That's different than when you have these thicker segments of calcification where even after atherectomy sometimes, you need a balloon to fully expand, induce the number of cracks that you need to be able to get good stent expansion. You can use lots of different technologies to achieve these things. OPN balloons, regular non-compliant balloons, cutting balloons, intravascular lithotripsy. These are all tools in a toolbox to give us the results we're looking for. The question is, when do you use what tool? So I'll ask the audience and the panel, all a group of learned people, to think about a question. How do you know your NC balloon is gonna work? Or if you choose to use an OPN, or you choose to use a cutting balloon, how do you know it's gonna work? What, what, do, you, what do you see that's gonna tell you you're gonna get the result that you want with that? Do you have a criterion or set of criteria in mind? And I'll give you a clue, it goes beyond this calcium score. That's what we'll discuss in the next talk. So for now, let's give you this piece of the simple algorithm, because I don't like complicated, right? If you look at some of the al algorithms out there now, they're, they're, very, they're very US centric, where it doesn't really matter how much, how much money you decide to spend, they just pull out device after device, and I, I work in a managed healthcare environment. I'm not suggesting that the US system is a bad system, it's a great system. But you know, those of us who are in a different part of the world have to actually manage these questions when we choose what device to use and when. So based on this simple IVIS guided scoring system, if you have a calcium thickness greater than 0.5 millimeters on IVIS, so no reverb or reverb less than 90 degrees, and you have an arc of over 270 degrees for more than five millimeters, you've got enough calcification where you need to modify. Take your rota, your IVIS, or your, uh, sorry, your rota, your orbital atherectomy, or your IVL. If not, then consider either balloon and stent if you have no angiographic calcium at all. And if you do have one of these two, you're gonna have to modify it somehow. And you're gonna have to figure out how you wanna modify it. And I won't tell you how just yet, but hopefully I'll be able to convince you that there are ways that you can make that decision too. And they are evidence-based and they are reliable. Thanks very much for your time and attention.